Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about what it is like to make commitment uh, to God, to your church, to one another. Uh, last week, in that commitment, we talked about tithes and offerings. Now, that's not really one of my favorite subjects. It's not. But God does talk about money more than 25 or 2,600 times in the Bible. And so, family, it's necessary that we talk about those things from time to time. That's part of our commitment to God. It's a step in obedience toward what God would have us do in our life. I mentioned last week that everything we desire before the Lord is on the other side of obedience to Him. And if we take the steps in accepting Him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, first and foremost, step into the waters of baptism... He expects us to serve, give of our time and our talents. Now, that's just not monies. That's giving up of ourselves. You know, uh, there's people around here that, there's men that, you know, have hung doors and replaced light bulbs and, you know, fixed doorknobs and, and on and on and on. And, and they do that because they want to make sure that our, that our facility stays current, that it stays, <clears throat> it stays in good shape. Because we're supposed to be good stewards of what God has given us to be able, a room and a facility that he's given us to be able to come and worship him. He has allowed us to have this place and he expects us to take care of it. If we do not take care of it, then I can rest assured it will fall down and he will take it away. You can't leave your home in disrepair and expect things to just maintain. You know, I'm, I'm thinking at the moment that on Sundays, we always uh, offer invitation to all of our children who want to come to lunch after church. And it's, it blesses my soul while there's a whole lot of kids. I mean, we're talking a lot of kids that we have between Sarah and I. And the cool thing is there's grandbabies. Now, that's my favorite part. The kids, well, they could stay at home and leave the grandkids. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But the thing is, is it warms my soul to sit in the rocking chair and, and hold little Leo or, or if Salem comes over and, and I can just watch everybody just talk and laugh and have fun with one another. It's fellowship. <laughs> Speaking of which, he's coming to see me now. <laughs> but if he, but if we didn't have that home, if that home was not in good shape, they wouldn't want a fellowship at our home. It's the same thing with God's house. If we don't have a place to worship, a place to fellowship, it's going to be hard to do that. We can't do it in the front yard in the open air if it's pouring down rain. So this morning I want to continue to look at having a stewardship commitment. And I know Steve's going to be happy this morning. The sermon's only three pages long. <laughs> but we want to take a look at what it what it looks like to continue in a, in a commitment to God and to others and to ourselves for that matter committing ourselves to the call that Christ has for us and so so often we have to look at the task that's at hand the task that's before us well in the coming days we're going to see coming months we're going to see a lot of things that are going to start to change around here you know there's going to be some walls that are going to need to be painted there's going to be you know as we said toward the end of the year next year carpet and recovering pews and things of that nature because we need to take care and we need to renovate. Sometimes things just need to be replaced over time. If you pulled up this morning and you see a big tarp on the roof, well, that's a good thing because we're getting a new top, a new steeple for the church. And I think God deserves a hand for us to be able to do that. God has equipped us with the availability to be able to do that financially and with the people to be able to do that task. If you haven't noticed, the bell that did not ring and hasn't been able to ring in years up in the steeple because it was basically rusted together is down, down here where everybody can see it and the little kids can ring it. Just don't let them stick their hand in it, you know. And I can tell you that if the little kids ring it, you better cover your ears because it is one more loud bell. But it's beautiful sitting out there. It really is. And I want that bell to be rung all the time. It doesn't have to be in the steeple for people to hear that church is open and ready. It doesn't have to be in the steeple for people to know that the doors are open and they're welcome. It just needs to be rung. People need to see cars in the parking lot and the doors overflowing and the pews full. 
And God can allow those things to happen, but we have to be obedient to his call. One person that comes to mind in looking in obedience to the call for his life was King David. Long before he was king, if we look at the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see the story of David and Goliath. And I don't know about you, but if you grew up in church, it's one of my favorite stories. And you talk about this little shepherd boy, maybe 12 or 14 years old at the time, slaying this giant that's nine foot, maybe nine, ten inches tall. Now, I have to be honest with you. When you're young, you feel like you're invincible. You feel like you're Superman. The older you get, the more you realize you, there's a lot of kryptonites in this life, and they tend to bring you down. But when David was young, he not only... Now listen, I want you to understand, David wasn't arrogant in how he stood before this giant. He wasn't. He stood in confidence. Why did he stand in confidence? Because he knew that the Lord and the, Lord armies, uh, the Lord's armies had his back, had his front, had his left and his right. So if we look at this giant, he was a warrior... He was a soldier in the Philistine army. And Goliath wasn't alone in this, and we'll later find out. But we do know that the Scripture says there was no one that would stand up against Goliath. Everybody was in fear, and yet this young shepherd boy comes into the field, the battlefield, where Goliath is standing, and he says, let me at him. Let me at him. No armament, no sword, no helmet, just a sling and five stones that he had picked up out of a river on his way to the battlefield. His dad wasn't in approval of where he was heading. His brothers made fun of him. And I am real confident that most of the soldiers on the battlefield, as it says in the scriptures, didn't think he could, it was, it was equipped to accomplish much of anything other than just be a little shepherd boy. But if we know the story, it's an important story. You see, here's the point that I want to make to you. While David had no sword, no armament, no helmet, no shield to protect him, Saul said, yeah, give him, give him a little bit of armor. While all the Israelite armies had fled before Goliath, before David was willing to stand there and fight because he was committed. He believed in Israel, and moreover, he believed in the God of the universe. And we need to be the same way. He believed and he was confident that he could be a champion. Not for David's glory, but for the glory of the Lord. Now, I want you to understand something. Goliath's standing on the battlefield and he's not only taunting Israelites, the army, the king, King Saul, David, but he was taunting the Lord as well. You go ahead and you make fun of God. You go ahead and you threaten God. And can I tell you, it's not going to end well. It will not end well. God is a God who is of truth, justice, grace, and mercy. When you walk with him, you walk by his side. He is for you. He is never against you. But when you turn your back on him, he is a God that not only breaks out in tears, but he is a God who is displeased, and he is a God of wrath. But David's not concerned with any of those things because he knows that God is with him. Goliath's challenging God's people to stand up and demonstrate that their God was more powerful than him. And you know what I love? It's that David was the only one that stood there and believed that very thing. David came into the Israelite camp and there was no other one that was willing to step up in faith and trust that God would be with him, but he was willing. David's faith was so strong that he was willing to believe that the Lord would go with him and that he would be able to defeat Goliath. And so he took five stones with him. I want you to hold on to that point of five stones. Hold on to it. We're going to come back to it. I want to read to you 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 36 and 37. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and uncircumcised, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defiled the armies of the living God. And David said, 
The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, the Lord is with you. Can I ask you a question? Do you know God's with you? Do you know that God is for you? Do you know that God is not against you? So often we want to say, as I mentioned earlier, that God's got our back. Well, most of the time he's in front of us and we don't even realize it. He's in front of us. He's already guarding us and protecting us from things that could destroy us. What he asks us to do is step out in faith. Look at the task at hand, what's in front of you. I want you to understand where David's faith came from. And this is, this is, I'm, ta I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself this morning. David's faith was born out of his experiences that he had already had with God. In his grace and mercy. God's been gracious to us. If we're still breathing, if we're sitting here this morning and we're able to hear this sermon and write down notes, and I trust you are, then God's been gracious to you. If you go home today and you have food on the table, a roof over your head, shoes on your feet, God's been merciful. He's been loving and kind to you. He knew that the Lord had delivered him from dangerous situations in the past, like from the lion and from the bear. And he proved his power and his trustworthiness to David. And David believed it with all of his heart. So he stood in confidence that he would most certainly be delivered from this nine foot tall Philistine. So David gathers those five stones. Yeah, I'm getting there. Be patient. I bring it up for a reason. So how deep is your faith? I want you to consider this. What's the Lord brought you out of? What's he delivered you from? Where is he taking you? And what does he desire for you to be a part of? What does he want you to do? Can I assure you that he's delivered you from calamities time and time again in your past and probably will again in the future? If you haven't experienced a tribulation in your life, a calamity, you will. We're promised that in John 16, in this life you'll have trouble. But before that, he says, I've given you these things so that in me you may have peace. Phil mentioned that verse earlier. And it's always interesting to me how so often verses are mentioned that are already in the sermons. And these guys don't know what I'm going to say. I think that's God. What about you? Amen. Amen. But he says he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. He gives us a peace that will help us overcome the world. And that peace is Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and our Savior. So what has God brought you from? Can I answer this? For me, he's brought me through tremendous things, and I guarantee you he will take, you through, um, take me through tremendous more amounts of things. God's not done. I'm still breathing. He's not finished. There's a good work to accomplish, not only for me, but for you. Are you willing to be obedient to the call that Christ has put on your life and whatever task he's called you to be a part of or whatever he's called you to take part of or do? We're about to embark on a new adventure here at First Christian Church for the first time since this building that we're in right now was built. A major renovation, major repairs on many things. While the walls have been painted in certain places from time to time, things are nice. There's still repairs that are necessary to be done. But we're going to step up to the challenge. Your leaders, your deacons and your elders have already voluntarily submitted their life to God's will and serving you as leaders of this very church. And they know these repairs are necessary. And they're willing to step up to the great challenge. And they're asking you to follow them along with the Lord to accept this challenge. Now, we're going to replace the carpet and the pews. And I said in the past couple of weeks when we talked about Nehemiah's wall, it only took them 52 days to rebuild that wall. I believe we can do this in 52 weeks. Why? Because I'm going to stand in confidence in the Lord. I'm not going to answer for God. But I believe we'll be able to accomplish this in 52 weeks. If not, well, then it's God's will for it to be another 52 weeks. But I'm going to remain obedient. And as I said, Sarah and I have talked, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to play a part in this. So I believe we can accomplish phase two this year. 
this year. Because that's God's plan. In my heart, that's what I believe. I'm not going to answer for God, but that's what I believe. This may seem like a giant undertaking. Well, it is. It's huge. We're smaller in numbers than some other churches. But I believe our faith is greater in this family than some. Smaller numbers, God doesn't care about numbers. God cares about your faith. He cares about who you trust in. Do you trust in him? He's willing to be your banner on the battlefield. Are you going to walk with him and accept this new adventure? Accept this challenge and be a part of a stewardship commitment that's going to help this church, this building, this facilities be here until God comes back. And that may be tomorrow. Hey, that could be this afternoon. That's up to God. Jesus said nobody knows but the Father. But what if it's another hundred years? I want this facility to be here and used for the glory of God when I'm long gone. But we've got to be responsible and help take care of it. Oh, let's get back to David. Those five stones... He picked up five smooth stones out of a river on his way. Well, was it because he was afraid that if he stood in front of Goliath with his sling and his five smooth stones, that he might miss Goliath and not kill him the first time? He might injure him and he might need some more stones to take him out? Nope. Goliath had four brothers with him. And his brothers were the same size. About nine foot, ten inches tall, give or take. You say, well, that's just a fairy tale. Well, uh, I want to tell you that there's been giants dug up, giant skeletons dug up, especially in the European and Northeast, you know, Asian minor areas in the last 20 years. Don't call God a liar. But David picked up those five smooth stones because he's thinking, when I get done with Goliath, if these cats don't run, I'm going to take them out too. Because he stood in confidence that God was with him. Can I tell you something? Picking up those five smooth stones and saying that, that's a man that stood in confidence. That's a man who stood in faith, and he put that faith into action. He put that faith into action. And we must have the same faith and believe that if we think there's a giant in front of us and making repairs and renovations to this church, then God will give us the stones that it takes to knock the giant down. Can I get it? Amen? Amen. This church has stood the test of time through good times, through bad times, through building projects, probably disagreements, through agreements since 1882. And God has not done with this church, and it's going to remain a remnant as long as I am living and breathing, and I pray to God after I'm long and gone, and be a testimony to God's grace until he returns and carries us home. That is my desire for this place. This is God's place. This ground is holy. And I want it to remain that way. So, what can we learn from Goliath and David? We can learn that God will serve. God will serve, yeah, when we serve. God is a God who is more than capable and he's more than able, but he asks us to be obedient to step up, to step out. And he's more than qualified to defeat any giant that's in front of us. Whether it's fear, depression, financial issues, doubts of faith, lack of trust, worry, whatever it is. If we know God and his nature, we should understand that God is more than qualified. So step out in faith. Trust. When we do not know what the future holds, we must trust God. When we do not know what the future holds, we must trust. But you can't trust someone that you don't know. Mm. Do you know God? Moreover, do you know that his son came to die for you on a cruel cross at Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you know that if you're sitting there right now worried about what tomorrow may hold for your life? Can I tell you that God already knows? And nothing takes him by surprise. While a week before Christmas, I was absolutely and utterly stupid, thrown back in my chair at, Ray, you've got cancer. God wasn't surprised. 
He knew it long before I was ever born that at age 53, I was going to have cancer. But I also believe that God is not finished. And I also believe that I need to trust him and I need to have faith in him. And if he chooses to take me home sooner than I thought, then that's his will. And he will make sure that this church, First Christian Church of Clemens, survives and tarries until God returns. And can I tell you, either way for me, it's a win. Either way. Now, I'm going to be selfish for a second. I'd much rather see grandbabies grow up and all those sorts of things. But we look for God's will and we stand in confidence of his will. So do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, we need to talk. So, with that being said, <clears throat> there's probably going to be someone who's going to stand in front of you or sit beside of you and say, oh my goodness, ah, what's wrong with the carpet and the pews? Well, I want you to ask the people that clean the church. You know, they've, they've called me and said, hey, the carpet's all wound up around the rollers on the vacuum cleaner. We need to you know, how do I get it off? Well, you just take a pocket knife and start cutting. You know, it's gotten to where it's, it's just rotting in places and the pews are worn. So we have to face a reality. You're not, as I said in the beginning of this, you're not going to let your home, your own home fall in disrepair, will you? If you can help it, you're going to try to keep it nice and clean. Again, I love to have my children around with me on the weekends. But they're not going to want to come to that place if it's all raggedy and falling down. We take care of things as we can. We're responsible as we can. And we're going to be responsible here. Now, hmm. Sarah's always moving furniture around. She takes a notion and she'll decide, well, I think I want this chair over here and this chair over here. And I think I want to move this table and this couch. And <clears throat> while we had to repaint most of our walls at the end of last year because we had some water damage uh, from a, a, a washing machine, on the top floor, I can look behind every picture right now and there's probably 20 holes behind every picture because she's not real happy with where it's at. <laughs> but she doesn't do that just because she's dissatisfied. She does that because she wants us to have a nice place to fellowship. She wants it to be nice. Stay fresh for her family. And while I look at all those little holes, I kind of grin a little bit and say she does that because she loves her family. Mm. we need to be the same way with God's house can you agree amen amen we need to take care of it God's given it to us and entrusted it to us we need to be honest with ourselves and with others about what we're doing with these renovations and trust that the Lord will see us through and see this through until it's accomplished why it's not so that we get accolades or get a pat on the back or somebody come and say, oh, you've got such a beautiful building. And you get to say, oh, well, look, yeah, well, thank you. It's so that God gets the glory. It's never about the accolades of man. But it's about what God chooses to do. And I want God glorified at 6131 Fry Bridge Road. And I trust you do as well. So family, I want you to understand something. One more thing, we, just a few more things we can learn from David. The Lord's on your side. The Lord's army is on your side. We need to stand in confidence. It's time to move forward to the future and have a great faith that God will take care of this church and this body of believers until the day he comes and returns to bring us home. And we need to be good stewards of what he's given us so that we have a place to worship his holy name. We do. We must be people that stand in faith that the Lord will provide. We must trust him to be our provider of every single need. So if we look back at the last two weeks, we need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord first and foremost. Step into baptism. Be obedient and serve. Give of our time and talents, our tithes and offerings. And today, be people of great faith. People of great faith. As Christians who have trusted Christ... As their only way to heaven, Jesus said to them in John 14, 6 and 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, 
you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Our battle with giants in our lives is going to result in victory if we trust and cling to God. If we trust to his strength and his power and his abilities. Period. The illustration of David and Goliath is only of one of many examples of supernatural power. that can only come from God. He cares for you deeply. Every one of his children. It doesn't matter whether they're yellow, black, and white, red, small, tall. It doesn't matter. They're all precious in his sight. And he wants what's best for you. So he asks you to step into his obedient will for your life. Sometimes that involves trials and battles. John 16, 33 already promised it, remember? But I want to encourage you. This may be the stewardship commitment. There may be some trials and things that come along with it. This is going to be no different than what we've faced in our lives already, brothers and sisters. Family. And Jesus Christ promised that we, in John 16, 33, that if we come to him, we can be an overcomer. I would much rather be an overcomer with Christ on my side. Christ in front of me, leading and guiding me, than with any other thing in this life. James tells us to consider it pure joy when we encounter trials in our life. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. When we're tested, we can, in the power of the Lord, stand up. And we can fight. We can fight any giant that's been put before us. But you must be willing to trust in your Lord and Savior today. Well, that's the only way you can win a victory. And with Christ. Not only by your side, but in your heart. In your heart. So you need to step into his obedient will for your life today. Where's your faith? Where is it? Is it in him? Or have you put it in man? If you've put it in man, then we need to talk today. Second thing is this. Are you willing to stay on target? Are you willing to stay focused? At the task that's in hand. Not only in your life, but the task at hand before you hear. I trust your answer is yes. Today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then we need to settle that for time and eternity. 